Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our second episode of the now named Let's Discuss with Parsons TKO. So exciting to finally have a name. And in case you don't recognize me, because I have now shaved my beard of many years, I am Tony Kopechny, the co founder and CEO of Parsons TKO. And today I am joined with uh, two colleagues who so I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, uh, I'm Adam Good. I'm an engagement director uh, with Parsons TKO, and I was inspired by Tony to almost shave my beard, but then I thought the, the law of the conservation of beards must take hold, uh, and so I'm still fully bearded, uh, but maybe next time I'll, I'll, I'll join the prestigious ranks of the unbearded. Uh, and I'm Rick Richards. I'm a digital business analyst here with TKO. Uh, I attempted to trim my beard, and it just grew right back out, kind of like in the, that Santa Claus movie, Tim Allen. <laughs> I, I do remember that classic movie. I do feel like Tim Allen quite often in that movie. Uh, all right, so today's topic is the value of content. Um, and you know, with these let's discuss just sessions with Parsons TKO here, we would like to say these are informed but informal discussions. So we think about the topic ahead of time and then we get on here and sort of just riff on that topic for a while. I think from our first one, since this is only the second one, but we learned in the first one, uh, we've been waiting too long possibly to have these because these conversations uh, are running long, but they're really rich. And so, you know, we do cut these into smaller clips um, afterwards and put those out. And we'll also keep the whole uh, long duration here too. So everyone can see all of it if they want. Eventually we'll start making um, transcripts with these as well for everybody. Uh, but for now, uh, I think, you know, we had these great conversations internally for about three years and, we are a remote company, so we were doing this on Zoom all the time, and then it dawned on us that maybe we should actually start recording these and putting them out to the world. Uh, and so here we are. So the value of content. You know, I, I think about the word content in the marketing communication space, and all I could think of is Jan Brady, right? Where it's like content, content, content. It's everything is content. But I, I don't feel like there's ever like a one throughput for all of it. And I don't know if everyone all sees it the same way or if they should, um, what does it really mean? Is content still queen? Is production what's really important? What I think we want to get into, what do we even mean when we say, is there value to the content? You know, for my, for my own sake, I've worked for a long time in the think tank policy space and everyone I worked with would say that they were the one stop shop on but then I don't know any of them that actually curate content from sources, right? So they're the one-stop shop on all the content they produce on the topic that they're talking about. But can you really be a one-stop content shop if you're, not, if you're not curating other content? So, you know, I think that's what I'd be interested in exploring today too. It's, 20, you know, it's 2019, the internet's been around for a long time. We've all seen those reports that come out every year that like, more data has been produced in the last 25 seconds than ever existed in the universe of time. Um, so with that, with that aside, there's a lot of content out there, right? And so, so what really matters and, and, and how is that connected and juxtaposed? And then you know, last week we talked about machine learning, uh, you know, so what are the implications of that? But, you know, Adam, this, this really started in a conversation I just having with you just about the value of content. Oh, and we have lost Rick. We'll see if he comes back. <laughs> I will say to everyone, uh, running a remote company, this is this happens. <laughs> uh, so, Rick just got Rick just got overwhelmed by all the data that had been produced in twenty five seconds that yeah. it just shut shut him down. Well, that's what happens to the internet, right? It all is there, and it's like, see, people. When people say there's not enough bandwidth, that's what they really mean. Not not somebody's capacity to get a report done on time. Literal, Literal bandwidth. bandwidth. Yeah. But I will uh, I will turn this over to Adam for a second. So yeah, content value. What what. Yeah, I think you know. I think we're we're definitely at a at a point where the content must provide value to your audience, um, and I think that's a core thing that is really easy to overlook in the rush to keep producing the same type of publications or content that an organization knows how to produce and is kind of their bread and butter. And you know, since we're in the think tank or, or nonprofit space, a lot of times that's reports or issue briefs or publications or strategy memos. Right? There's kind of this rush. We got to keep churning this out. We got to get this content out there. But, you know, we are in a world where, you know, it's very unlikely that any particular organization is going to be a, a one-stop shop. 
um, because people, you know, are finding content through through Google, they are finding content through social media, and they're really sort of patterned to find the content that is useful to them. Um, and there, it's an increasingly noisy world of content. Um, you know, there, we talk about content is king or content is queen. And I think if someone is just looking for content on the internet, they, at least I get the appearance that like content is a kleptocracy where it's just tons of people producing tons of content and they're trying to steal the attention from you. Right. So if you do a search on, on YouTube or on Google, you know, the top one or two pages are going to be people that are just churning out lots of content to get your attention. Um, and, you know, often that is with a mind to provide value to audiences, but often it's uh, with, the, with the dollar, uh, with the bottom line in mind. How can we get as many views as we can? How can we get as many um, link backs as we can? Um, you know, you see that you go to an article and you, it's a slideshow that's broken out into 10 different pages because they're counting page views, right? So, you know, if, if for an average user just exploring the world of content, there's a lot out there that is not valuable. Um, so it is even more important for organizations to really think through, who am I producing this content for? What do I want them to do with it? Um, because it is less about consumption. Hey, let's get a publication out. Hope someone reads it. Hope someone shares it. We hope we get 5,000 page views or a million points or you know whatever the vanity metric is. Um, and more about, did this provide value to a specific type of person um, that we want to provide a specific type of value for so that we can build a relationship over time. As, as Rick likes to say, I'll kind of steal his thunder a little bit and then kick it over to him. But you know, content is really about facilitating conversations at scale. If you think, particularly in the think tank space, a lot of, a lot of the, the work that ends up ultimately being important is done on a one-to-one -one basis, right? It's, it's, a, it's a researcher that's meeting with a, uh, with a um, decision maker. Uh, or, or an executive. And those are the kinds of, kinds of, kinds of, kinds of, ah, kinds of conversations, say that three times fast, um, that organizations want to have. Um, and content, uh, you know, digital content and a lot of the tools around it, such as email, allow you to have those conversations at scale. But you really have to think through who am I talking to? What are they going to actually provide? Um, what, what are they going to find value in? So right before it turns to Rick, so there, I took a bunch of notes while you were talking there, and I don't know if this can influence you too, Rick, but you know, first I'd say as a Philadelphia Eagles fan, I mean, I understand hope springs eternal. We actually did win one, finally, but, you know, for many, many years, hope would spring eternal, and that hope is not a plan, right, of action. So I, I like where you said that. I mean, and then I thought as you were talking there, attention, you know, I, there's the great book by Tim Wu about the attention merchants, and that is a big reason where we came up with the philosophy here at Parsons TKO of engagement architecture, where if it's been an attention economy, how are you competing in that if everybody's trying to do that, right? And that then tied into another statement you made too, which was content experience. Like, is there value in that where I don't want, because I know you're trying to get more page views, this disjointed slide deck experience, like just give me the information, man. Um, but yeah, so in, like, and then content discovery and what channels you're being forced to do that. And so, you know, for us, when we thought about that, and if this makes you think about it, Rick, for some of the work you do in the, the data strategy realm too, just engagement, it seems to be what matters, right? If it, I think it was an attention economy and it's getting people burnt out. And now it's what does content do to create engagement and get somebody coming back? I think that word burnout is is the key that 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 I would like everyone to know content. Uh, content burnout is real. Content is here. Uh, it's been here for a couple of years and it, it just, it's just getting worse. I mean, if you even just paying attention to the news cycle and seeing what's happening with Facebook and Twitter, uh, and we're at the point where we don't even necessarily believe content uh, anymore um, when it comes in front of us. And that's the position when, when an organization is, is putting something together and, you know, as Adam said, is thinking about who exactly, you know, has a persona in mind or has a couple people in mind that they're writing to, that they're creating that content for or curating that content for, um, and then pushing that out there. Think of where those people have, have, have been. Uh, in the course of their day, when are they seeing your content? Is it the first thing they see in the morning? Because that's going to, the tone there is going to be a little bit different. Uh, and as, as we were talking about this just now, I just started thinking about speed dating. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a different, different tone you take if you're like the first person versus the, the hundredth person. So think about your audience, uh, the people you're writing to, 
this may be the hundredth piece of content or the thousandth piece of content that they've come across in a day, uh, especially so if they're if they're searching for it, if they're doing uh, organic search or on an ad, um, they may have already looked at a bunch of junk. Um, there's, you know, not to get too into the weeds, there's plenty of content out there that's just uh, handed over to, um, to, to other teams to just kind of generate junk content with the right keywords in it. Um, you can put that, you know, th there are businesses and there are there's software where you can take some of those keywords and it'll spin up an article that sort of kind of makes sense, but isn't actually really useful. Um, and so if you're, the person you're writing for has just gone through and seen dozens of those, um, then you need to really make a case for yours. They're already in a state of burnout when they're encountering your content. Yeah, and that can be hard, hard to sell, hard to prove the value of, of yeah. your content at that point. And, and to piggyback on that and to kind of connect this to, to Tony's question about the content experience, a lot of what organizations need to do is create positive affinity at every touch point that someone has, right? So to Rick's point, if you're looking at 100 pieces of content, you know, in a given day, and 80% of them are worthless, either because the, the value just isn't there, or because the experience is bad, you're going to quickly either forget who produced that content or, you know, block them mentally in your mind. When you, scr you know, when you scroll through that results page and you say, oh, this, this article is by that organization. I know that's junk. I'm never going to click on a link from them again. Right? So what you want to make sure that you're doing is getting your name, your brand associated with quality content so that when someone does go to organic search to, um, you know, to, to look for something, if they see your name come up, they're going to immediately have a positive association with you because you've provided value in the past. One of the um, ways of doing that is thinking through, like in your video strategy in particular, like what types of thumbnails are you putting in your videos? Are they showing the best part of your brand? Are they showing a person that's kind of looking at you and smiling and saying like, hey, you know, we've got this so that people can start to build that relationship. Um, you know, there, there's a reason why if you do, you know, pretty much any type of um, video search on uh, on YouTube, a lot of the thumbnails have people smiling, right? Because or looking directly at you, um, because content is about building a relationship over time. And you know, having looked through and and, and read, you know dozens of junk articles about SEO, for instance, I know that there are a few names that I trust and I will click on their content before I click on someone else's content. That's not being a one-stop shop. That's being like a trusted source. So I, I, this is making me think of now two ways to think about value. You know, Rick, I think in your example, when you're talking there, there's the hard dollar cost for a market-based incentive, right? And so if I do get the clicks, if I do just keep putting junk out there, I can then go back and say, to my superiors, they look at these metrics, I've got this many potential impressions and this many potential things. And out of that huge number, something magical might come out the other end that could turn into a sale. Um, so it, it, it's, it's very old school, it's not nuanced, but we've, we've created market incentives to push that forward, which is, is probably a disincentive at the end of the day to finding good quality content. And then Adam, I was glad you brought brand up because I think when you, to move this into a mission driven sector, you know, I, we deal with this all the time and trying to convince prospects or clients to come and do certain types of work with us, which is, I always think, man, if they were, if it was much more market driven, right. And there was just the bottom line, this conversation would be very different. And it's, and it's, it's not on purpose because that's the way the mission driven sector works. Right. Um, but brand really becomes a value asset. And so, you know, I, I like what you're talking about there. When I worked at the Pew Charitable Trust, that was one thing that really got honed into me, right? Is what brand is value attribution and the content gets that halo value attribution from it. And that's not necessarily dollars and cents, but it is the kind of thing that you come with a trust factor as a mission-driven organization that other groups might not. Like uh, Sigma, Sigma, Sigma versus, you know, share our strength when it comes to kids uh, that need to get food. You, you have this instant brand recognition. So does, how does that relate in your mind to value of content, value of positioning? And then I think what I would say is, and then the risk of your brand when it's out there, right? Like if it's just market value, you gave me $5,000 and I lost it all and didn't get anything back. Okay, that sucks. My boss isn't going to like that. I go out there as, as a top name mission driven organization and then I sink my content and then the reputation at the same time. I think that value impact is, 
is a lot harder to deal with. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the your content is only as valuable as what it as as how well it aim it does what it aims to do, right? So a lot of organizations are like, hey, we've always created you know publications, we've always created reports. That's what we do. Um, we publish them, we send them to some you know members of the press and some contacts, and you know we hope that that creates a ripple effect, right? Content value ultimately comes down to what is your content trying to do for you, um, and so I would say that in most cases. Organizations a need to figure that out and really, you know, measure their content and improve it against those types of, uh, of metrics and goals. Uh, and the other thing is, think of content as a vehicle for uh, for continuing that engagement and that relationship with your audiences. So I would say that if you're t kind of looking for places of, of value in the organization, the most <laughs> the most valuable piece of your organization, or the most valuable asset that you have, is is likely your list, um, your database, your CRM, or your email list. The people that know you well enough to have given you information um, and have set and signaled, like, keep communicating to me in some way. I, I'm interested in continuing this relationship, um, making sure you're serving those people, keeping those people, and furthering them down an engagement path. So when you think about where is the value in content, the value in most cases is did it convince people, and, and not convince in like a shady sense, but like, was it compelling enough to provide value? So that people say, okay, I'm going to give you my email because I want more of this, or I want to hear more about what you have to say. Um, and you know, that's where I think the rubber really hits the road with, with content, right? You have to know what you're trying to do um, in, in order to improve the content and measure the value. And in most cases, what you should be trying to do is grow your list. And, and that gets you know, to a big point about um, to all of this, really, like, like branding and, and, and email and um, uh, you know, content may be king. It's what everyone is kind of paying attention to, but I think text is queen and is probably more important um, and is, is unfortunately the thing that people pay the least attention to when they're thinking of strategy uh, because context, uh, uh, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying. If, if, you're, if your article is being viewed or your content is being viewed in a list of a bunch of junk content, it may not stand out as much. But if your content is being viewed on your email list and someone signed up specifically to receive that content, the context is very different. And they're going to look at that uh, with different eyes and, and notice different things about it and pay a deeper level of attention to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that, like, that not only helps uh, with building the brand and uh, you, know, you, you can control your context, right? <laughs> When, uh, when someone's on your email list, you can control how your organization is seen and you can control the level of, um, of trust there. Uh, people might be a little bit more forgiving of, of something there. At the same time, it's also really easy to have four different teams put together really amazing content and send it all out within five minutes of each other. If <laughs> which, er, which erodes uh, trust, right? Which erodes trust, but but that's the context, right? Like each team might say, this is the most valuable piece of content we've ever produced and we can't wait to get it out. Um, but if we're not going to coordinate and we're not going to target the audience and just blast it out there to the entire list, then the context is, uh, we're, just, we're just making stuff and you can read it if you feel like. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, so... I love to get into the context bit here. And then also it sounds like, you know, the idea of content is don't just be there, but be there with a purpose, right? Like give me something. Don't just be there because you're there. Um, but, you know, I think what you're talking about there, Rick, too, and Adam, if you think about this, how do federated teams with that are under a brand umbrella, but work pseudo independently, on their area of expertise, how do they coordinate themselves so they don't fire hose, you know, the audience once they get there? Or, you know, is there something in building a data culture that that can create an internal trust? Because what we see is there's just the communications teams tend to be smaller, the marketing teams tend to be smaller within uh, the mission driven sector, and then they just get all of this coming at them, right? And so to try to assuage or speed things up sometimes they turn the keys over and they'll say great every program can launch whenever they want and then it's so rare that i remember at the institute of peace we did the salesforce implementation and everybody had their own lists 
And then they're like, well, my list is my list. I'm like, okay, I get it, but we got to get it in here. And then we, I ran this extra report on top of it, 80% overlap. Because when I had started there, I was like, I'm going to sign up for every single newsletter. And I would get four or five between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. I mean, it wasn't like it was spread over the day. It was just constant. And it was badgering and annoying. And it was, how did I get better? And then, so I don't know if you guys have ideas for anyone who might be listening. Like, how do you make this better so that you don't, everyone, all boats can rise. You don't turn off any audience and that there is some trust that you're still going to get the message out. And it's still a hot idea, even if it doesn't yeah. happen right this second. Yeah. The easiest that's... way is probably that, like, to, to actually bottleneck it again. <laughs> uh, to your point, Tony, of, of not giving it out to everybody and, and democratizing the, the email sending process, but um, to have a, a director of some kind that's got a vision um, and is thinking about the overall context, right? I mean, it's sort of like, um, if everyone's responsible for writing one chapter in a book, there's going to be somebody who's got to put it in the right order so it makes sense. Yeah, and, and to that point about the, putting it in the right order so that it makes sense, I mean, I think one, one thing that organizations should have is a uh, content operations plan. Um, and you, a lot, there's a lot of talk about content marketing and content strategy, um, but I really like to think about it in terms of, of content operations because that gets right to the heart of, how do we actually make sure that we are doing the work internally that we need to do to make sure that we are um, furthering relationships with our contacts? Um, and I said that rather than sending out content, because again, sending out content is just a vehicle, right? It is just a tool to continue to deepen relationships with audiences. Um, so you know, we talked about content, we talked about context, but I think contact contacts, not three, two, one contact. Um, I mean, that would be cool. Um, but um, the individual contacts that you have, right, that is the most valuable asset that your organization has. And so thinking from a, at it um, from a perspective of, okay, here's who we have in our system. Here's what we want them to do. Here are all the areas of overlap. Here's the type of messages that we need to provide to them. Here's the, the types of content we know that they appreciate and value um, based on, you know, hopefully some analytics. Um, you know, there's, there can be some kind of qualitative anecdotal evidence of like, oh, you know, we know this group because we worked really closely with them in the past and they're, you know, they really like these webinars every time we publish a new report. Oh, great. Now everyone can learn from that and say, are there other segments of our audiences that could value that type of content? So coming at it from a structured place of operations that is tied back to that ultimate value of the content um, to either get new contacts or further engagement with previous contacts or current contacts, um, I think is one, a kind of two conceptual ways to, to, to think about it. There's a, there's a lot that could go into that, you know, programmatically or, or tactically. Um, but I think that's a fundamental shift that organizations need to make. Yeah. And, and that's not to mention all the, the technological uh, approaches that can sort of augment uh, what, what you're describing there um, in terms of, you know, getting all your, are all your systems on board. Um, with your strategy too, because you don't want um, a variety of systems that aren't talking to each other that are also not, uh, you know, uh, there's a director, they have a strategy in mind and the software is doing something else um, and is not paying attention to, doesn't know the strategy, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, so there's, there is a very real technological impact there to be evaluated um, as that fundamental shift happens. So I think, you know, driving, driving into that, the technology, the content operations, you know, production value, I, I am fascinated and I like to talk about being effective versus being efficient. And I, mm -hmm. I think that plays into this. You know, I worked at uh, the Center for Global Development many moons ago, uh, and there are a lot of economists there. And so we got into great discussions over how could you value a piece of content? And, you know, is it the large paper that, they wrote that maybe gets 10 downloads or is it the blog post that suddenly gets shared across the planet and you know 300,000 people see that maybe they go to the the larger piece or not but there was something there to warm them up to entertain them and get them in um so it's you know and is there a difference between effect and efficiency and is that a way to look at content value internally at a mission driven organization like what's the right piece that i should be putting more of my time towards? Should I be churning out more blog posts or should I be writing more long form papers? 
yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways to, to address that last question. So I think, and again, it comes down to, you know, what work do you need the content to do? And is it doing it? And do you, do you have a way of measuring if it is doing it well? Um, and, and a lot of that is going to be balancing um, different levels of effort against different outcomes, right? So if your outcome is ultimately to influence policy, then you can say, hey, should we spend X amount of time creating this long form report, knowing that it's going to get in the hands of 10 people that will actually may, be able to make a difference on policy? How much time do we spend on that versus blog posts that are going to be read by um, maybe uh, maybe some of those same um, audiences, but maybe a wider audience, maybe media audiences um, that don't necessarily have as much impact on the ultimate goal of the organization. Hmm. This is not to cut you off, but I mean, it's making me think too, you know, the two different approaches there. I feel like we talk to a lot of groups that assume they're doing B to C outreach and communications, right? Like the blog post is important because a million people see it. But you're making a strong point. I mean, this is, I think, more times than not, it's B2B type of business that actually needs to happen. And it's more B2B type of communications where, hey, we actually do know the 10 policymakers that can do this and they will absorb the paper, but I have to also get it to their legislative assistant and then maybe pressure within the districts where they're at by having this go into an op-ed or something locally. So I don't know I don't know if that jars anything for you, but it, it, it jarred something for me there on the B2B versus B2C. Yeah, I, I, that, that really gels for me. And I think that the main thing there is that you have to be able to measure that. Like, I, I, think, I think it's right um, uh, because B2B has a certain model of um, providing expert expertise and expert resources for people to do a very particular kind of work and outreach, right? And that's what a lot of the think tanks and organizations in the mission-driven space are, are looking to do. Um, and you can't do that effectively if you don't have a plan and a structure in place to capture whether or not it's working, right? So if, if you're creating a great report that you are, you, you personally as a program lead in an organization, email directly to your, your contact as a high level policymaker, that has to be tracked, right? That relationship, that touch point, the outcome of that, that needs to be tracked in the system because otherwise you're just like, yeah, we, we emailed a bunch of reports to people we knew and that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, for t particularly for those, you, there are ways to track high touch, um, high value engagement um, touch points. Um, and one of, one of the issues is that often what happens is that that type of high touch engagement is siloed from communications and marketing in development um, because it's a, a high touch is about cultivating the high value donors. Um, and so that tends to be tracked a little better than high touch engagement with policymakers, particularly as it relates to content. Um, and that's why, you know, we, when we talk about engagement architecture, you can't think of those in silos, right? You have to think, what is my model for defining what a contact is for my organization and tracking their engagement over time? Um, because then you can feed in those types of questions like, hey, how, how effective was that report? Oh, boom, I want to be able to pull a list of all policymakers that we have contact with, all, me you know, hi all high value media targets. When they got their email, did they, re did they read that report? You have to be able to find those numbers um, to be able to actually you know, improve and understand how you're doing. Yeah, and that's such a tra tragedy too when those things get siloed because um, you know, to, the, to the earlier point about do I write the long form or do I do five short blog posts? Uh, why not both, right? Uh, there's no reason that you take one form post if you're doing one of those a month, let's say, um, and one of them gets a lot of traction with your, with your key audience. Now you know, okay, the people I want to reach are reading this and they're really excited about it. So that means that there's other people that are, just aren't aware of the value of this long form content. Well, that's a series of, blo uh, of blog posts or that's a series of emails where you can kind of tease information that's in those reports. You know that this audience um, is interested in these, the, these topics from this paper, you can unpack that uh, and then contact the, you know, let's say that only 10% of, of a given audience has, is aware of it and loves it. Um, but there's no reason that the other 90% wouldn't love it. They might just not know about it. Um, so there's a, a definite value uh, or a, a, um, there's a way to unlock value by repurposing um, that content as its own marketing for itself. <laughs> um, and, and so much of this 
gets into, you know, content is not only a way to deliver value to your audience, it's also a way to learn what value your audience wants and is expecting, um, which then becomes an enormous value for your organization because your next campaign gets even more targeted and your next uh, donation campaign gets even more um, material for look at how important our organization is. We did, we delivered these, uh, these huge findings to, um, you know, the right people at the right time. And now uh, that's made a, that's made an impact on, on the Hill or something like that. So, I mean, I'd, I'd go back to, it's interesting. It sounds like, how do we repackage content? You know, there's, I think, internal value in that. There's only so much time in the day. Everybody wants to always write the new original piece. But, you know, we talk a lot about relevancy and vibrancy and trying to balance those. Um, and sometimes the most relevant piece to something that just happened in the media is something you wrote 10 years ago. And the way that most organizations have structured their you know, web infrastructure, it's probably impossible to find that. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you how do you harness that back up and pull it in? And, you know, I don't know if you, it's, you know, we talked in the earlier part of this conversation too, just about the attention landscape trying to always be there. So something's there, but maybe there's value in it's still your content. It still has the purpose when it shows up, but maybe it doesn't always have to be something that someone had to write that day. Like how do we repackage and how do we curate to also, Hey, and put our content, our content in context juxtaposed with the other pieces. I think about the Folger Shakespeare library we've worked with and the power of curating their collections, right? It's, there's this one thing they have, uh, this manuscript, but when they put it in the context of these other pieces that groups might not think to consider, it takes on a whole new type of value and a whole new type of meeting. Um, and so how, how, how do we think about that in terms of content value or the I, value I, of content? Yeah, I think in terms of like recency, it's, it's somewhat knowing your audience. I mean, a lot of this comes back to, to knowing your audience and knowing what performs well. Um, but I would say if you're looking at your audience and looking at your subject matter, you, can, you should get a sense of how often should I pre be producing content for my audiences that are interested in the subject matter. Um, and that's where, again, in the mission-driven space, it's probably going to be somewhat different than in like a B2C place uh, in the B2C space. Um, we, one of our one of our clients does a lot of groundbreaking work on what's going on uh, in in Ukraine uh, and particularly around disinformation um, and disinformation around the world. There are people that are passionate about that content that really care about it that really want to to understand what's happening uh, in in their countries and, and apply those lessons. And so a lot of it is showing up, showing up regularly and saying, "Hey, you're interested in this." We're doing the work so that we can bring you the, you know, the the latest and greatest thinking about this that you're actually not probably going to get elsewhere, um, and so they need to be showing up regularly to continue to build those relationships and and deliver that expected value, um, and I think that that idea of expected value gets gets back to what Rick was saying was that the more that you publish, um, if again you have a, an apparatus in place to analyze how it's working the more insight you get into what your client or what, what your customer, what your audience expects from you. Um, and you know, maybe they, maybe you're saying, Oh wow, when we do a, a two paragraph blog post every day, we actually get a lot of traffic from that. And we get a lot of shares on that because people go, okay, even though I'm an expert on, you know, disinformation tactics, there's this one piece that that highlighted one thing that's really important. And I actually can share that with, with my friends that aren't as in depth uh, in into the subject matter as I am, um, so that that gets to the idea I think of 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 recency of how often you publish what. Um, the and it not only tells you you know what's important to your audience, it tells you when it's important for them to receive it. Um, we can we kind of keep touching on this concept of sequencing, um, and and the order of things and the strategy of you know when things get sent. Um, but that's, uh, you know, Adam, I think that's where you're, you're kind of, you're kind of right there, right? I think we need to drop the word funnel, even though I don't <laughs> no, <laughs> It's like the, the word no, no one wants to touch because then it becomes its own, uh, its own call. But um, um, yeah, right. Like that's, that's what this all comes back to is, uh, if you if you send something at the wrong time in the wrong you know the information itself might be incredibly valuable but if it's in the wrong format at the wrong time um or coming at the same time as a as a 
as you and your uh, during your your annual fund, um, it it might get lost or it might get taken the wrong way or or just not seen for the valuable piece of content that it is, um, and that matters so much, uh, and that's where also the tracking really comes in. Uh, to your point, Adam, is that you know a lot of organizations will test. You know, what happens if we send this at 10 a.m. instead of 2 p.m.? What happens if we send this at 8 p.m. Uh, on a holiday? What what does that do? Um, and there are many ways to to test that and just see what effect those you know, non uh, or seemingly trivial aspects of the content delivery method are actually really crucial in unlocking the value of that particular piece of content. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the w without without data to show how the content is doing, discussions of its value are just hand waving, right? It's it's hocus pocus, and, unless you actually have data to say, hey, we know this is doing what we set out to do. Um, and without that data, you can't improve, right? You can't really improve without something that um, that helps you know what you're doing well, what you could, or su and suggest what you could be doing better. Um, you know, one of the things I love to talk about is the Amazon a Amazon's homepage. Right. So, you know, a thought experiment is think about the last time that Amazon redesigned their homepage. Right. You can't because for the past 10 plus years, they've been redesigning it via optimization every minute of every day for ev tons of different users. So if you get 10 people in a room, have them all pull up Amazon, uh, just go right to the homepage. They're all going to see a slightly different version of the homepage because Amazon is going, oh, OK, we're thinking about unrolling this type of content. Let's put it up here on the top right, because we know based on data points X, Y, and Z that that might work. And they're running tests to see if that actually does work. Um, and so they're constantly improving, again, based on, on data. And the more you have that data, the more you can make more intelligent guesses about what you should do, and then assess those guesses and see if you should roll them out further. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to, um, you know, uh, it, it, we, we talk a lot about like a, a culture of data. Right, or a culture of analytics um, that you know, if you're serious about getting better with your content, you don't look at the content, you look at the data. Well, I'd say yes to all this, but it also begs that there has to be some kind of process behind all of this, like and a purpose. Why are, why are you doing what you're doing? And now with what's that strategy and then what's the tactics we're trying to take on and then apply the data against that to answer the questions that we need based off what we're doing and how to improve. Like if I think of Amazon, you know, it was a bookseller, right? We had all the books in the world and then they started adding in different products. They still wanted you to buy books when you went there. So then they always have that like, and here's the books you've been looking at. And then, oh, but we sell food now. Oh, but there's this home thing now, you know? So it's, it's interesting because I think about that too in the mission-driven space. I think about just you know, any space, you know, the, the homepage rotator, like make sure we show everything from every program just once. But you know, maybe that's not why everybody was coming because they didn't want, they wanted your opinion on a thing that day that they trusted your brand for. And then there's all the other pieces that you can start turning them on to. Um, I feel like that's, you know, people talk about the algorithms for related content on websites. Um, you know, my audience will get watered down. I remember I, there's certain groups I've had this with and, you know, Pew is interesting because it's such a wide variety and it was like, trying to convince people that if someone cared about tax policy, they still might care about saving sharks. It's okay if that's at the bottom and they know that we have that type of work too. Like they, that, per, that, that single journey that you think of for the, the tax audience, right? It's, it's, not in, it's not as individualized as you think because mm -hmm. if they are there and they liked it, the chances are they'll like the next thing. So I like that idea about Amazon and optimizing, but it really, it, it begs that there has to be some kind of strategy laid out to Rick's point, the funnel, like we are making this content because of this type of audience we want to reach because of this action and outcome we want to see in the world. And, you know, we talked a bit B2B, but there, there's B2C groups we work with too, right? There's the advocacy organizations and the groups that do want the single individual donors, but it's still the same thing, right? It is, it is still that funneled approach. Think about the content, test it, optimize it, produce it and get it out there. So, you know, that's something we're, we're hot on here. And it's, it's, again, it's like the unsexy thing that's super hard to sell, but governance process standardization. Uh, it doesn't sound fun, but it's so empowering when it is in place. It is amazing what an organization can do when everybody gets in and says, I know all the rules today. I know how to produce these things. I know how to get it out. And you know what? We're actually going to look and optimize based on the numbers. 
because it's standardized, we're able to do that. And we could see where the dips and the peaks are. And, and is it because it was summertime and people were on vacation or was it because what we did was just not what they wanted? Yeah, all of those are excellent points, right? Because ultimately what it comes down to, you have to have a target, right? like for, for your organization overall, but also for your content, you have to have a target. Uh, and then when you have the target clear, you have to have your tools, right? You have your, 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 air, your, uh, your bow, right? Your type of bow that you wanna use. You have the types of arrows you, you wanna use. And then you have the apparatus around that. Here's how often we produce arrows. Here's the specifications for the arrows. You have you know, trainers who are like, here's how you shoot the arrow at the target. You have analysts that are looking at how many times did the arrow hit the target? Um, Right, you have that whole apparatus around it, but it all comes down to the target. Because if you don't have that, you might as well have like, you know, you know, a, a poster of Baywatch that everyone's throwing pieces of baloney at, right? And going, oh, that type of baloney really hits the pic the picture of Baywatch in a nice way. Um, uh, you know, this this is what I call the baloney Baywatch uh, content model. What? Um, what? Trademark. <laughs> we haven't you haven't heard about this yet, Tony? No, I have not heard about it's, baloney and Baywatch. You've got it. What's <laughs> what, what's I just happening? Came up uh, it, it, being being purely facetious, saying if you don't have a clear target, um, uh, then you you might you, it's very difficult to, to understand the the effectiveness of what you're doing, right? So if you have a target and a, and a bow and arrow, you can say, okay, here's how we can improve that process to make sure we're hitting the target. If you don't have that target clearly defined, um, then every other piece of that kind of uh, is harder to uh, is harder to implement. Right. Um, and it sounds super complicated, but then, you know, on, on the other end of that is uh, what Tony was talking about. Uh, imagine being able to come into the office and there's a list of questions uh, and it just says, you know, 90% of your audience would like this question answered at this point on the website. So can, you know, at that point on the website, they're in the blog. So can you write a blog post of the, of, X number of words that answers that question. Uh, and then 50% of your audience would like this question answered when they're reading their emails uh, between email two and three. So can we write a new email two and a half uh, that answers that question? And we know that people tend to read about half of their emails, so make it short. Um, I don't know, that seems like the gold standard to me. If you just had, had <laughs> you know exactly what you need to write, who you're writing it for, what the tone is, what the length is. Um, and that's, that's what the, uh, having that strategy and tracking everything correctly can tell you really. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's like the whole organization needs to get on board to understand, you know, I hate the phrase, just throw it up on the website. Cause what, it's not wallpaper, man. Like, or you could make it into wallpaper and then you'd have this pretty wall that everybody walks by, you know, maybe they look at an ad on it, but that's, that's not what it's about, right? This really is organizational strategy for, for depth, for increased audience, which is increased revenue or increased outcomes or increased impact in the world. This isn't, this shouldn't be an afterthought. Um, I like the, you know, Sig Ziglar, all the sales training stuff, but he's got the quote, something like you can't hit a target you can't see. And you can't see the target if you don't have one. You know, and I think about when it comes to the mission-driven space, the big worry is to create targets from a strategy means you are limiting some aspects, right? You're not looking in every direction. You are gonna look in, you're gonna look in this direction, which means there are some things you won't take on at that point in time. And I think for groups that feels limiting or just uncomfortable, there's discomfort in what if I miss this opportunity because something came in. And what I like to think about and I try to tell people is you'll still see that opportunity, but then you'll have a, a notion of if I take this on, what else comes off the boat? Not just let me throw another thing on and let me hope that somebody's going to work 65 hours next week and Saturday and Sunday to maybe be able to do this thing. And we won't do any of it well. It would be far better to say, let's take this on this year, create this path, be able to measure it, be able to optimize it. And say whether we want or not. And then, you know, everybody wants to be agile. But agile is a process, right? And it is based off of a, a known backlog of things that will go in for a known outcome. It's not just like, hey, I showed up to work Tuesday at 9 a.m. and I want to like, I want to make popsicles, man. Parsons TKO is going to just make palettas. 
that's that's what that's what we're doing today like that it's not that's not agile right like yeah i could, I could introduce that idea and then maybe we think about whether a paletta shop is the right thing for us and then we slowly be make palettas over time but like agility is just hey we do this in shorter sprints we're not saying the entire year has to be this big plan and then we only march towards that what we say is how do we put this into incremental shifts right so let's you know, I like to tell people, I like to, let's look at a quarterly, like an OKR type of thing. And then after that quarter, with if you have great data, like Rick's been talking about, we do it with the data strategy. If, it, if it's instrumented correctly, you could sit there at the end of the quarter, three months in and be like, oh, wow, we're not getting where we need to be. Why not? What's the data telling me? How do I react? But it doesn't mean you throw everything out the window. And you, it's like you suddenly need a new strategy every three months. It's just what tactics are actually working to get us where we need to go and how do we amplify it? That's what this is making me think when I think of, of content value. But I don't know if you guys, it's, it, we are getting, I think, close to an hour maybe. So uh, any parting thoughts? I, I was curious what you would call that, that fear of missing out in the nonprofit sector. Does that have a catchy acronym? FOMO. Uh, yeah. I, no, I, 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 opportunistic funding maybe or, or opportunistic positioning is that there will be times when you're working on a mission and it's not making national news, right? And then there's that one day in March on a Thursday morning where no one expected and it's like, oh my God, it made Good Morning America today. Like everyone's looking at this, how do I take advantage of that? And that's to me, if you have the process, if you have the plan, if you have the governance models, you will react extremely quickly because it's not like, Oh my God, who creates the content? Who signs off on it? Where should it be placed? How does it work? You'll know all that stuff yeah. and you'll be ready. And so I, I think that happens. And I think there's this, there's the random meeting, right? Development or fundraising finally gets that meeting and it turns into, Hey, I need a proposal about X. Mm -hmm. And this happens to us in our business. I need a proposal about X in three days. We've never really written that type of proposal before, but I know we can do it. Uh, let's get that done. It doesn't mean you're shifting everything, but it's like, how do I turn the attention to make that happen? I, I'd say I think that's where the fear comes from, is that if I'm so focused on one thing, I, I might not pay attention and hear the signals around me. But I, you know, I don't know. You, I, I run a lot, you know, and sometimes I do it with headphones and sometimes I don't. But even when I'm zoning out, like, I'm still going to hear a truck if it honks at me, right? Like, I'm not that out of it, even though I'm focused on something else. Like... I think those signals will always be there. And I actually feel like they're better received if you have some kind of focus. Yeah. And, and those are, those are no, known, known unknowns, right? And like in the sense that like, we don't know when this type of thing will happen, but we know that it will happen. My favorite so, rums, my favorite Rumsfeld quote. Yeah. There, there's, there's some singers, <laughs> um, but you know, right. Like you can plan for those, right? Make a playbook, like the sudden media appearance playbook, right? What kind of audiences are we going to get? What do we want them to do? What type of content that we have that can serve them? Just have a checklist, right? You make a playbook for that. It's 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 easy. I, I, yeah, I don't I don't know if I have a fun acronym, you know, FOMO, I guess. That's for it's a topic for the next video, perhaps. Yes, yeah. <laughs> FOMO for nonprofits. But if you work to parse TKO, we can make sure you don't have to have FOMO. <laughs> yeah, we will. We'll help you get there. Uh, any final thoughts from you, Rick? No, other than just you know, listen to listen to uh, your audience, listen to your your members. If you're a, a member based organization, um, they're they're already telling it's valuable. Uh, what content you have that's valuable, and it's worth taking a t taking a moment to sit back and 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 listen to what they're saying, whether that's through analytics, whether that's through email responses. Um, there's some way that they're they're letting you know uh, what they like and what they want to see more of. Rick, could I summarize that as don't listen to your heart? Don't, yeah. Don't listen to your heart. <laughs> listen, listen to your audience. So, yeah, I mean, content value, you're in, in membership organizations is another great thing, right? Part of the reason you sign up is for that, that content. And I, I think we've said it a few times here, but it's the content with purpose, the content with context, the content that's giving me what I want instead of just trying to get me to click. It's not about audience. It's about engagement. It's about quality. Um, and making sure you push that out first, right? And having a content operation model that can that can really push towards that value. So whether a mission-driven organization doesn't have the same market factors on it, it, it still does in the end of the day. They still only have so much time. They only have, and then they have the quality margins 
and they are trying to get conversions and engagement because that keeps them in business too between fundraising and having an impact. Uh, so it seems all equal in the end there. So I have had a great conversation. I've enjoyed this. We will, uh, like I said, we, we usually, well, this is our second one, so usual for us. Uh, the general operation at this point, we will have the full length video. We'll make some cuts and we'll make some smaller versions of this. Uh, we are experimenting with possibly getting transcripts, but we'll have some, some show notes, maybe put some links in underneath the post. And if you want to talk to any of us further, you know, please feel free to reach out, use the website, put your, put your name and email in there, and we will certainly follow up. But it's been a pleasure talking with you both today. Thank you very much. Uh, yep, absolutely. And if, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, hit like, hit subscribe if you're interested or enjoyed the, this video. Let us know in the comments uh, what you'd like to hear us talk about next or if you'd like for us to, to drill in more into any of these topics. Or if you're still just really confused about the Baywatch uh, baloney metaphor, I'd be happy to talk with you more about that. I'm very confused about that. <laughs> <laughs> We're all confused. I'm confused. I do kind of want a bologna sandwich now, though. But... Yeah. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. All right. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye.